about the Taft Hartley Act. Taft Hartley Act. Uh, this is a a uh, a union busing bill that was put up in in place in 1947. So let's take a look at how this bill came about, what it says, and uh, and really how it it fought back against unionization. So this is post World War II. This is 1947 is when they're talking about this act. 1947. Uh, at that point, we had seen two years worth of uh, strikes and protests and pushbacks for better wages, better work conditions, and better jobs in general, which was all that was promised to the, to the American working class um, during World War II. So they basically said, hey, let's put you know, um, unionization aside. Let's put uh, you know, strikes and collective bargaining aside. Uh, for the war effort, let's make sure that you know um, we win the war. We got to take care of this situation. There is there is uh, fascism and and authoritarianism happening across the country, or happening across the globe. And you know we w what if we're next? We got to fight for what's right. World War Two happens, big manufacturing boom. Everybody goes back to work, right for for the big war effort. They go back to work and, uh, you know, strikes and collective bargaining were paused because freedom, freedom, you know, so World War II ends, come back into a peace economy, and uh, and now people are seeing that, you know, they there aren't as many jobs as they were promised. The wages have gone down, so people started striking. It's very similar to what happened after World War One. If you remember the 1919 Seattle strike, the 1919 Winnipeg strike, uh, the general strikes that happened in those cities, the gen and then the strikes that happened all across the country because of that, uh, that eventually led up to the um, 1919 Boston police strike that we all talked about uh, a little while ago. And if you haven't seen those videos, they are available on my channels. So please go check them out. Um, but um, very similar stuff where, you know, the government said, hey, we're going to pause on this, on, on, you know, increasing wages or anything like that and negotiating with you guys because we got to win the war. And the workers were like, well, of course, of course, we got to win the war. We'll do what we need to for the country. We'll stand by you guys. And, uh, and then the war ended. War conditions didn't get better. Jobs ended up, people ended up losing their jobs. There were more veterans that were homeless because there weren't jobs to come back home to. And uh, nobody was getting paid much of anything. And the government was just like, well, I mean, hey, guys, huh? You know me, old government. Huh? Have I lied to you before? Huh? Come on. Me and you, we go way back. Come on. Well, I'm good for it. I'm good for the month. It's coming. It's going to be just fucking don't worry about it. Okay? Just relax. I got to go. And then they, you know, smoke bomb and disappeared. That's basically the same thing in World War II. So part of the reason why, you know, the, the everything kind of comes to this halt is because there's a manufacturing boom when it comes to when it comes to the war effort, because everybody has to get together. We're, we're making tools for, for guns and tanks and planes and U-boats and all this other shit. And then that comes to a stop, and now we have to adjust for a peacetime economy where we're not developing as much shit to go into a war effort. Now we have to figure out what do we need in the country to move forward. Probably agricultural needs, probably health needs, probably, you know, better food, better housing, better living conditions, maybe a better infrastructure, right? So these are peacetime things that we need to think about. And the country didn't adjust to that because the country was set on a wartime economy. Um, and this is sort of the, the, the flaw in capitalism. Right? Capitalism it, this is a weakness. This is capitalism's weakness. It's an economic model that's built on more. More, 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 more. It's built on greed. It's built on constantly producing things. It's built on constantly making shit. 
Uh, and when you get to a point where you don't need to make as much as you did before, right, um, it just falls apart. It just falls apart. It works in booms and busts. Um, you know, it's an up and down economy. But who is it up and down for is never the rich. It's never the banks. It's never the corporations. It's never the, you know, the top 1% of 1%. They never see the economic down. It's us, right? Same, it's, it's the fucking veterans that came back to, after the war and couldn't find work. It's, the, it's the, the manufacturing wing that worked, you know, long hours at shorter pay to ensure that America wins the war. Those guys are the ones that, that hit that, that suffered during the bust. What we need is an economy of stability. One that doesn't go up and down all the time. That kind of stays at a straight even line. So that when we come into a economy of peace, everything doesn't collapse. That we know how to adjust when we get to that economy of peace. When we have shifting things that, you know, make the economy what it is, for so to speak, right? And it's probably part of the reason why America looked at, you know, they were like, oh, wait a minute. We do really well um, when war is involved. So let's, and, you know, let's develop a, a, an industry surrounding it. Hence the military industrial complex, right? They were just like, wait, these people are striking because they're not making weapons. Fucking let's make all the weapons. Let's sell it around the. Let's just make up enemies. Let's, you know, and that and and this bill does make up enemies. Well, let's just say the Russians. We fucking don't like you, you commie bastards coming in to, to 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 sneak into the night, and uh, and and what and what these they they take these straws and they put it into your chest into your sweet American heart, and they suck out all the freedoms. That's what these commies want to do. Is that what you want? Is that do you want the freedom sucked out of you? Like, like it's a root beer float made out of hammers and sickles. So they just, we've just been constantly making enemies. Uh, and we have the military industrial complex because we need that war economy. We, we have to drive an economy out of war because in World War II it worked. It worked in that one moment of time. So let's make that moment of time, you know, exist forever. Dwight Eisenhower did uh, warn us about that too. Uh, talked about that in a prior Forkful of Noodles episode um, that um, that I can link to as well. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll put a link to that at the bottom. Uh, so, uh, you know, the Taft-Hartley bill comes in uh to kind of push back against these strikes, to be like, all right, we're done with these strikes. We saw them in fucking the 20s and 30s, and, uh, and they're real bummers for corporations. They're real bummers for, for you know, the, the, these politicians that have to show face and just be like, no, 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 we're for the workers. And then they're actually, like, making us be for the workers? Like, they're actually making us do the work for the workers? Like, the people that we're supposed to rep They're actually making us represent the people that we're supposed to represent fucking gross let's write a piece of legislation so we don't have to do that again and we can just force interns to blow us in our in, the, in our offices that's basically what this bill was constructed to do it's a it's it's a union busting bill that made sure that the unions were didn't have any power written by two senators senator robert taft a republican from ohio and fred hartley a republican from new jersey uh and if I'm being honest, I forget that New Jersey is a state. Uh, and they constructed this bill, which was called the Labor Relations Management Act, which became the Taft-Hartley Act. Uh, Labor Relations Management Act. Oh, what a, what, a, what a nice name, right? When you read the name, you're like, oh, this sounds good. You know, labor relations and, 
and they're gonna manage labor relations. They're gonna they're gonna make sure like the workers and the employers are gonna be taken care of. Like that sounds so much fun. That sounds like it's like such a nice act where everybody gets a little bit, you know, everybody's taken care of. We're gonna be relating to each other. We're building a relationship between labor and management. We're gonna hold hands. We're gonna make sure this sounds like they're going to democratize the workplace, and it's literally the exact opposite of that. That's basically what you got to worry. When, whenever you see these bills come out, um, and uh, and they're and they're, it's it's like, hey, it's the Give Americans um, Give Americans Money Act. It's basically we're going to increase taxes um, on uh, Americans buying groceries and also we're going to tax every breath that you take from the car into the grocery store uh so if you can't hold your breath uh also now the parking lots are uh one and a half miles away from the grocery store so good luck this is the american gets money act this is so <laughs> like it's always the opposite of whatever it is right it's like labor relations it's just like we're going to tear down labor relations um this, this was built uh, basically a, a way to defund unions um, and push McCarthyist ideas. Remember, we're going to make Russia the enemy, right? We're gonna, we got to worry about these Reds. They're here. They're here right now. They're in your backyard, okay? Something you don't know about the Reds is they hide as plants. So... Um, they push these McCarthyist ideas, and this is nothing, anything new. Uh, again, if you remember back to when we covered the 1919 Seattle general strike, the 1919 Winnipeg general strike, the uh, 1921 uh, Blair Mountain strikes, the 1934 general strikes that happened in San Francisco, they used McCarthyist shit all the time. Uh, they were calling them uh, something of Lenin. There was some alliteration there, uh, Bolsheviks. Uh, the Bolshevism is in America, you know, so any, any time that anybody advocates for unionization, collective bargaining or strikes, they were always pushed as these Russian plots to destroy American freedoms and values. They were here, they're taking the hammer and they're beating the freedom out of you or they are cutting the freedom out of your chest with that sickle, right? And it's no different. I mean, this McCarthyism has not disappeared from our society, by the way. It's still very clear and present and it's it's in our society um, you know like it's it's still here it's no difference than the intelligence communities today that fight back against uh, or you know uh, movements like the Black Lives Matter movement anti-fracking movements pro LGBTQ movements they all blame that shit on Russia um, and and if you don't believe me there is an interview that Aaron Mate does on Pushback, which is his show on the Gray Zone. Highly recommend checking out Aaron Mate. Uh, he's the guy that kind of debunked, uh, that used the Mueller report to debunk Russiagate. And essentially was like, obst obstruction is not collusion. Uh, and, you know, was just like the ma corporate mainstream media has been pushing a conspiracy theory for three years. Uh, he does a conversation with a former CIA analyst that basically comes out and says, well, things like Black Lives Matter are used as Russian plots to destabilize the American government. And it's like, yeah, but also, you know, there is a large number of cops killing black people. There is a large number of cops killing innocent black people, innocent native people, innocent Mexican people. Uh, also, there's a lot of discrimination against gay people in this country. Also, their fracking poisons the environment. Like, uh, that's a fact. And just by saying that doesn't mean that you're a Russian. It's just, it just means that you have um, this really specific organ called eyes, uh, and you use this other very specific organ called your brain, and, uh, and you're able to understand facts. <laughs> So back to the Taft-Hartley Act. Uh, the first thing that this does is destroy the Wagner Act. Now, the Wagner Act, some of you, if you remember the video we covered 
on the 1934 San Francisco general strikes, uh, the Wagner Act was put into place in 1935, uh, basically legitimized unions. It let uh, unions come in and in, into the workplace and negotiate on behalf of the worker, um, and it kept anti-union propaganda out of the workplace. So you couldn't discriminate anybody for wanting to join a union. You couldn't you couldn't fire somebody because they were part of a union or because they wanted to unionize. Uh, you know, it, it kept the it, the clause was that the employer was neutral in the workplace. Um, that the employer was not going to interfere one way or the other in whether the employee wanted to join or did not want to join a union. They, they, they wouldn't make a swaying argument one way or the other. They would let the union kind of speak out and say, hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. Um, these are our dues. Do you want to join? Here's how we can help you. Here's how we've helped people in the past. And if the employee looks at that, if the worker looks at that and goes, nah, I don't, you know, that's not my bag, that's not my cup of tea, that's not what I'm interested in, then that's their right to do so. The employer cannot make that decision. And depending on that decision, they can't like fire the employee or take legal action against them or anything of that sort. That's what the Wagner Act in 1935 did. The Taft-Hartley Act uh, basically took that away where... Um, it let the, the employer uh, push back against the union, and it basically got that neutrality out. And what they claimed it did was give the employer a voice against unionization if they so chose to be against unionization. So if they wanted to, uh, the Taft-Hartley Act uh, would let the um, union, or I'm sorry, the employer, the corporation, uh, create anti-union messages under the guise, and this is literally what they say, is restoring balance between management and labor. Once again, right? Man labor, management, re relation, we're restoring, we're restoring balance. Uh, you're not restoring balance. There was neutrality in place. You know, unions could come in and make their case. The employee could, could make that decision themselves. They could look at the union and be like, you know, I don't like the dues. I don't want to pay any dues to be a part of this thing. You know, I don't care about collective bargaining. I trust the em employer. If that's their fucking, if that's what they believe, that's what they believe, right? The union isn't going to push to force these people into joining them. And the corporation isn't going to force them to, to, to not join them. It, it, it gives the employee, the worker, freedom to choose whether they want to be. And now this is essentially bring it's not restoring but it's it's disrupting the balance because now you have uh, companies like Amazon, Walmart, uh you know all these big corporations uh those are the two big union busting ones you know uh, that kind of come out and they're like yeah no unions are bad they want to uh suck freedom out of your uh out of your heart so and that's <laughs> that's how they fucking present it there's Cases like where people watch video after video about not unionizing because it's against freedom. No, the, no, the Wagner Act in act put, put in freedom. In 1935, the Wagner Act gave the employee freedom to join a union or not, to be a part of collective bargaining or not. And the employer coming in and saying, hey, it's communism or whatever the fuck propaganda they want to throw in there and made that legal... In 1947, 12 years after the Wagner Act was written, it, it, it basically, like, it opened the doors to all the right-to-work laws, and it opened the doors to anti-union propaganda being present in the workplace. This is not restoring balance, and this is not freedom. So, it also ex uh, expanded executive powers, so the uh, president and the attorney general... Um, could investigate and penalize unions, uh, you know, if if they if they deemed their actions against the uh, national emergency concerns, the national health concerns of the country. So, uh, let's say that a strike, uh, like an Amazon strike, was going to stop consumer goods from reaching people's homes. So, under the Taft Hartley Act, the president and the attorney general could claim that this strike was. Um, you know, illegal and penalize the union, uh, put an injunction on the union, uh, 
you know, call uh, sue the unions for for creating a health national health emergency because now it's like, oh my God, the dildos aren't getting to to Americans' homes and they can't diddle themselves fast enough. You know, the the butt plugs are not reaching Americans' homes, and and people just have these a like open assholes like they're cats walking around these homes. Is that what you want? Is that the is that is that how you want to live your life? We got to close up these buttholes. That's what America believes in. That's what America was built on, and that's what Amazon is trying to do. They're just trying to regulate American buttocks, and these strikers are getting in the way of Americans having the freedom to regulate their buttocks. And the, and the president and the attorney general, thanks to the Taft-Hartley Act, have the executive thing to look at the unions to be like, you are now penalized. We're going to run an investigation uh, 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 about the unions uh, striking and calling for collective bargaining uh, that created this national health crisis of buttock regulations. So uh, in order to strike under the Taft-Hartley Act, um, the unions have to say, you have to give them 80 days. Um, they give them 80 days to collectively bargain with the corporation. And if, and if it's, uh, if it's, a, uh, if it's between the management, like supervisory management, uh, so somebody like a general manager or something. So they have to give them 60 days to call a strike. So within those 60 days, they have to collective bargain and they have to come up with terms. So, you know, if they basically call a no strike order during the 60 days, they can't strike. And if they don't reach a collective bargaining thing and they're like, you told you, you said no strikes, uh, it blocks the unions from utilizing that as a tactic, which is bullshit. And again, if they go, if they strike. And, and the president or the attorney general claim that it is a national health and safety concern. It's a national health and safety emergency. They can put an executive uh, order in place to conduct an investigation, penalize the union for striking, um, and, and, and essentially disband the strike, right? But this is all restoring balance. We're restoring balance to America. This bill is, um, is the butt plug of all bills. I'm going to let you guys sit with that one for a minute. <clears throat> um, <laughs> it's... But it does give uh, it does give corporations an opportunity to continue their terrible treatment of employees, right? So you have sixty days to come up with a negotiating plan, um, sixty days to to talk about collective bargaining, sixty uh, sixty to eight well sixty to eighty days, um, depending on if it's with a supervisor or with the corporation itself, uh, you know. And there's no strike orders put into place, so it just lets corporations do whatever the fuck they want. So even if the corporations are like, no, we're not going to collectively bargain. Uh, the unions are kind of stuck in our between a rock and a hard place. So, and it also makes wildcat strikes impossible to do because of this, right? Because uh, in order for you to, in order for it to be a legitimate strike, with in if, if there is no, if there isn't a no strike order put into place by the corporation, thanks to the Taft Hartley Act, uh, you can't just up and walk out. So technically speaking, despite the fact that striking and even wildcat strikes are within your legal right to do as an American worker, it makes it harder to claim the legality of it thanks to the Taft-Hartley Act. So even if you walk out of your job because Amazon knew about COVID-19 cases, knew that somebody was sick in the warehouse and they didn't shut down the warehouse to clean everything, to make sure that everything is secure, to make sure that everything is sanitized, and they knew as a corporation, and they told the upper management not to tell any of them, and the upper management decides that they're going to run a wildcat strike, the corporations can do whatever the fuck they want. They're not, they're not at fault for putting the public in danger and then claiming that, oh, the unions are against the public. 
No, motherfucker, you're against the public. <laughs> and that is exactly what happened with Amazon at the end of March when they fired Chris Smalls. Now, really what the Taft-Hartley bill did is it took advantage of the fact uh, that unions represented all the workers. And they do. They represent all the workers. So regardless of what the results of these strikes were, regardless of the collective bargainings were, all the, all the employees would benefit. So if you have employees that are not part of a union, they still benefit from it. If you have employees that are part of a union, they still benefit from it. So let's say you're an employee that's part of a union and you go on strike and, you, you, and then there's other employees that are not part of the union that go in and they still make the money that they make on a daily basis, right? And the striking employees, they don't get paid uh, at all. And then they get, you know, a, a 25% raise. Uh, everybody gets, so, so now the, the non-strikers, the non-union employees got paid uh, for working during the strike and they, they just got the benefit of that collective bargaining. So it de-incentivizes you from joining the union. You know, so the employee goes, why the fuck would I join this union? Regardless of what the fuck happens, I win, right? And now, sure, you can make the argument that if, if the union was backed uh, by, like, some government subsidies or something like that, like by a government fund, um, if, if it was, like, a nationalized thing, and, you know, they were, they were part of the labor department or something. Sure, okay, they're, they're getting money regardless. They're, they're an organization that exists regardless of whether people are paying dues or not. Uh, maybe it comes out of taxes or something, right? But even then you would have people pit, bitching and moaning about it. Even then you would have people pissed off about it, right? So... Really, the question should be is if the unions are on the side of the worker, if the unions are going to go to bat for the working class people and you are going to benefit as a member of the working class, you are going to benefit from it. Why would you not support them in the first place? Why would you continue to go work for a corporation that treats you like shit, that doesn't give you what you want, that keeps you away from your family? Why? Because of this desire that you need to work. Maybe you don't need to, maybe you need to work, but you don't need to work at that job. And then this also allows the corporation to scapegoat the unions. So if the collective bargaining agreement fails, if, it, if it's not reached, then the corporation could be like, look, the unions were overreaching over here. They were asking for the moon. All right. They were literally like, we want 30 percent of the moon. And that's just crazy. So we just couldn't give them anything because we clearly they're unstable. Right. And then it makes the corporations look like the good guys because the unions were going over the top and crazy and stuff. If the collective bargaining went through, then these bosses get to claim that they're the heroes, that they're the ones that did the right thing. You know, they negotiated really well. They are champions of negotiating. They're super smart because they have a lot of money. And I don't know if you know this, but the more cash you have, uh, there's like in the back of your head, you can just deposit money and it increases your brain power. I don't know if you guys know this or not. A lot of poors, a lot of us poors don't know that because we're too stupid to realize that because we're just putting like pennies in that slot. And that's not enough. You got to put 20s in there. So, and the, and I mean, you know, obviously the rich are able to do that. But it scapegoats them. It, it gives these people an opportunity uh, to scapegoat them. Now, uh, th what the Taft-Hartley Act did also say as a way to kind of win over a bunch of people is that there are free speech protections. What we're doing is we're giving free speech protections to the employer and the supervisors to make all the statements they want against unions, and that is part of of their free speech and we're protecting their free speech to say things about unions uh it's probably not true you know that that they're communist that they're uh that that they're against american values that they're trying to steal freedoms and money away from the worker that it's not good for the worker you know they get to say all that and the taft hartley act is protecting their freedom of speech now the opposite is not true 
if you come out and say that this corporation is not treating the employees very well, uh, that the employees deserve better wages, better work conditions, that they should be able to work uh, only eight hours a day, that they should get weekends, that they should be paid overtime, uh, that they shouldn't have to be in death-defying conditions, that they deserve a lunch break, that they deserve to go home and see their kids, that they don't have to work two, three jobs to make ends meet, to make sure that all their bills are covered by just having that one job, making sure that their health insurance isn't a a, 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 a hostage situation that links them to their job, to fight for all of that, that's communism. And that means that you are committing treason and you are going against America. There's no free speech protections for the unions. There's no free speech protections for the, for the employee to speak out against a corporation. But there is free speech protections for corporations to straight up fucking lie. So um, there are uh, six key amendments that I want to talk to you about that I want to make sure that I get to regarding the Taft-Hartley Act. Uh, some of the stuff we've gone over um, as we've talked about this. So the first one is an affirmation that the Wagner Act intends to protect workers' rights uh, to join or uh, form or join unions and to engage in collective bargaining with their employers remains intact. And it does, right? They still have the right to do that. Um, it's, it's, um, it's just beyond that. Things start getting a little questionable. Uh, a section that shields workers from being coerced into joining unions and imposes penalties for discriminating against employees who uh, refuse to join unions. So that's basically the last two things we talked about. It's the free speech protection. So uh, it lets corporations talk shit on, on unions if they feel like talking shit on unions. Um, and it ensures that everybody gets the benefits of the unions, which, you know, from, from the research that I've done, from, from all the things that I've read, uh, the the AFL, the, the the longshoremen's union, the coal unions, the minor unions, regardless of whether you were part of the union or not, you got the benefit anyway. This just kind of took advantage of that and put it into law uh, saying that you don't need to join a union. This is basically like the unions would go in and be like, we're going to fight for your behalf. So you might as well like keep an organization that's going to fight for your behalf funded. Um, and, and we'll always make sure that you are the, you know, you're, 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 you're the first thing that we think about. The worker is the first thing that we think about. Um, a statement that a corporation or business owner cannot deny a prospective employee a job solely based on their decision not to join a union, uh, except in certain exempted industries. Uh, I think construction was one of those industries uh, where I think they gave like a week or something or there, there was some clause about uh, like certain industries you need to be part of a union um, and the union person gets like more precedence than a non-union person because I think there's just more protections involved in certain industries. But it's, it's interesting that the, the, it, it's that they can't deny an employee for not joining a union as if the unions are going to come in and be like, no get rid of this person you know what i mean like i don't think they did because the, considering the fact that the unions were representing all workers that was the point um of of unions to begin with uh, a provision that gives employers the right to sign labor agreements with union officials that requires certain employees in specific industries to join their organization no later than 30 days after they're hired uh this is the other one that I want to, <laughs> that I really want to hammer home. A stipulation stating that unions must bargain in good faith with employers. Basically, this is this is a statement to me that's saying, um, well, uh, the unions are going to give in to what corporations want. The corporations get to say get get to kind of play hostage negotiator here, uh, and realistically, the corporate corporations are the ones that are holding rights and hostage. Uh, people don't need to bring in collective bargaining if the corporation listened to the employees and was like, hey, our work conditions suck and we aren't getting paid enough. Uh, rents are going up. Food prices are going up. We'd like our wages to meet that. And the corporation says, like, this is highway robbery, communist, right? Um, and then this is another one that uh, I think is important. A prohibition of secondary boycotts by unions stating that unions cannot coerce or 
uh, urge other entities from engaging with that employer if a labor organization union is embroiled in a dispute with an employer. This is essentially saying that you can't have sympathy strikes. That you can't call for other, um, uh, other unions to join in on a sympathy strike. And it was very much a way, um, or to me seems like a way, to um, push back on general strikes. So it's going to be very difficult for them to create a, uh, a general strike because you can't get other unions involved. You can't get other industries involved to uh, put pressure on. So like Amazon, um, you know, under the Taft-Hartley Act would not be able to, um, they wouldn't be able to get people from like the Walmart coalition or the uh, fast food industry or the gig economy industry and say that they're in, in strike and solidarity. So it's essentially a, a, a provision within the Taft-Hartley Act that uh, attempts to take away solidarity from the American worker, which is bullshit. So there was an amendment in 1959, this uh, Langram-Griffin Act uh, amendment. So let's, let's read through a couple of these. Um, so the state labor relations board and state courts were accorded legal purview over cases declined by the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, there's something called hot cargo packs in which rival employers uh, take concerted actions with the unions in, uh, in advance of a boycott against uh, another during a subsequent labor di dispute and provisions that tighten secondary boycott injunctions. I think this is basically like uh, rival corporations can't come in and try to like offer better, um, you know, better wages, better work conditions, and, and negotiate with the unions, um, which I get. Prohibited unions from picketing for the recognition of organizational support. Uh, so it basically kind of revokes the Wagner Act in this, in this case, that they can't be represent, representative of that, um, that they can't be represented. It delegitimizes the unions. It doesn't, it doesn't see them as a legitimate entity in terms of uh, in, in, dur during, during picketing. Uh, the construction industry was allowed to establish pre-hire and seven-day union shop contracts. So that's one of the ones where I think unions, union workers are preferred over non-union workers. Uh, permanently replaced strikers were accorded the right to vote in union elections within one year after the start of a strike. So basically these are strike breakers that get hired get to vote uh, in union elections, and they're going to vote on in accordance with the corporations. Um, so that kind of, again, took a little bit of power from unionized workers. Uh, the requirement for an affidavit me mandating union officials w swear in an oath that they are not communist uh, was, was repe repealed. That was a pretty authoritarian thing to, to, to make them claim that they weren't communists. Um, so that oath was repealed with this with this amendment uh which is good but it didn't really stop red baiting in that era uh because here we are they're still red baiting today uh establish a code of conduct assuring union members will have certain rights within their union while imposing enhanced reporting requirements on union union officers employers uh or consultants so this puts more regulations on on what unions can do and kind of deregulates the corporate industry um, so those are some of the important little amendments that I that I wanted to kind of make note of um, that I thought was kind of important to talk about. Now, there were some attempts to try to get rid of the Taft-Hartley Act. And the Taft-Hartley Act is still in place today, by the way. Um, Clinton, Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, they talked about it. They talked against it. Uh, but they got Republican opposition, and then they bailed. Did, didn't really put up a fight. And that goes kind of in line with how the Democratic Party has acted in accordance with worker rights. They'll say that they stand for worker rights. And publicly, they'll you know come out and make a big stink. Oh, the Taft-Hartley Act, it's not good. It's terrible for workers, blah, blah, blah. And then they just won't do anything about it. 
you know, the Republicans will come out and make a statement and the Democrats will go, oh, well, we tried. Well, we got, what, 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 and then they fucking bail. So nothing gets done. Uh, and, you know, it, it kind of confirms and solidifies that the two-party system is not on their side. We are not at the negotiating table when it comes to the two-party system. The Taft-Hartley Act being in place today, you know, and there's, there's a lot of bills. This was written by a Republican. The Espionage Act was not. The Espionage Act was written by a Democrat, and that is still in play today. These acts, these bills are the ones that really take away our freedoms, really take away, um, you know, the things that we stand for. And, uh, and these part, I mean, this half-hearted measure that you are for the worker, that you are for freedom of speech, that you stand against or you stand with the people is how the Democrats have acted. They don't really care about the working class. They just need to show that it looks like they care about the working class. If they actually cared about it, then Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton would have pushed against it. But that's not what they wanted. Bill Clinton especially. Bill Clinton was trying to push the Democratic Party further to the right um, and, and you know, govern in that direction. And keeping the Taft-Hartley bill in place is a way to ensure that the country is still shifted to the right. And it shouldn't be. That's not how most people line up with. I think most people line up with standing in solidarity with the working class, making sure that we are taken care of and making sure that we have uh, a governing body and an economic body that takes us into account. And that's what it should be. And that's what we should be fighting for. That's what we should be protesting for. That's what we should be um, you know, standing up uh, to, to ensure that our rights and our voices are represented in, a, in this government and this economic system moving forward. That's what we should be fighting to create. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video. If you are new to this channel, uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit that bell so you get notifications when uh, I put up new videos. I'm going to be putting up videos every single day, so there's going to be a ton of content coming out on this channel. Uh, there's going to be storytelling, uh, commentary about the media, uh, historical commentary, philosophical commentary, all surrounding uh, stand-up comedy. If you, if you like comedic commentary about these topics, then this is the channel for you. Uh, and if you uh, come to the channel often and you haven't subscribed, what, what, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button. Get, get, get subscribed to this. Come, come hang out with us. <laughs> but uh, for more information about me, you can go to my website, uh, ramanoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. Uh, while you're there, you can check out all of my past stand-up comedy albums, which if you snag them from Bandcamp are available as pay what you want, which means that they're uh, available for free. Uh, you can check out past videos, you can check out past podcasts, and uh, you can donate if you have the ability to make a one-time donation or become a sustaining member. You can donate directly on my website and become a sustaining member directly on my website. And Or you can see how, you know, the various different ways that you can make a donation. And you can also find out about live stand-up comedy events. Well, live-ish stand-up comedy events. I'm going to be doing uh, a test show on Zoom. Uh, tickets are available for that right now. They are free, and there's only 10 spots available. This is going to be a test show to find out, you know, what format's going to work, if there are technical difficulties that I need to figure out, and then figuring out uh, what consistent day to try to do... Um, these Zoom shows. I'll probably do a couple of them uh, while we are uh, currently in the quarantine situation. So that is available. Uh, the tickets for that are available right now. There's only 10 spots available. Uh, so make sure that you grab them 
um, before they're all gone. And then once we decide the date for the first official live-ish stand-up <laughs> comedy Zoom show, the virtual stand-up comedy show, uh, there will be um, about 15 tickets available for the first one. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there and we'll see, see what happens from there. Uh, so grab those tickets and come hang out with us uh, on the Zoom, uh, like I said. Make sure that you're subscribed. Make sure that you hit that like. Make sure that you share this out. Get the word out about these videos. And uh, and you can go to my website to find out more stuff. Uh, Till the next video. Take it easy.